Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, members of the legislature, Congressman Seth Magaziner, thank you for being here, our general officers, Chief Justice, and members of the judiciary, municipal leaders, members of my cabinet, and my fellow Rhode Islanders who are watching at home, including my mom, Willa. And I want to thank everybody else for always asking how my mom's doing. Good evening. When I started thinking about this year's State of the State Address, I thought back to the first inaugural speech I made in March of 2021. Rhode Island was in a time of significant change. We were faced with many challenges, and what we felt like endless, what felt like endless unknowns. At that time, I asked my fellow Rhode Islanders to join me, to come together as one team and meet that moment head on. On that day, I shared something I used to tell the players I coached in basketball. The team I coached was called the Rhode Island Shooting Stars. They were a group of young men from all different walks of life, family situations, and backgrounds. And no one thought they could succeed. They were underestimated as a team and as individuals. But through hard work and dedication, they did compete. And they did succeed. I'll have more to share about that, their successes later in this address. But throughout the team's journey, I always reminded them, good teams are built when talented individuals do their best. But the best teams, the very best teams, are built when talented individuals use their skills to help others do their very best. When I became governor, I believe that Rhode Island could do better, be better than just a good team. I knew we could be one of the very best. Over the last three years, we've risen to that challenge. We've shown that it's our turn, that we can compete, that we will compete. And if we work together, all we can do is succeed. Tonight, I'm here to cheer on our home team and share our game plan for Rhode Island's future. I have never been more confident. The state of our state is strong and getting stronger every single day because of the team that's doing the work in all 39 cities and towns. In the end, it's about the work that we get done. And although I, have, uh, as much, I haven't had as much time to be on the basketball court these days, I'm enjoying my new role as coach of Team Rhode Island. And why wouldn't I be? Together, as one team, we've made so much progress over the last few years. Here are some of the quick hits from our record, a record that I share with our speaker and our Senate President, and the members of the General Assembly. We reached the lowest unemployment rate in Rhode Island's history. Ninety-eight percent of our schools have improved attendance this year. Thirteen thousand fewer students are chronically absent this year. We have a record number of jobs at Quonset. Our state's fiscal outlook was upgraded. We're ranked second best in the nation for young workers seeking a job. And we're ranked in the top 10 best states for raising a family. There's more work ahead. But tonight is about the people who are doing the work to make all this progress happen. Last year, we, we set a challenge for Rhode Island to reach Massachusetts student achievement levels by 2030. We're doing this by improving three main areas, RICAS scores, 
student attendance, and FAFSA uh, completion. When we set that goal, I told a story about a painter who wanted to paint the perfect sunrise. Every day, the painter would get up, ready to start. Then he'd think, oh, this sunrise is beautiful, but maybe tomorrow will be better. Long story short, he never got it done. Last year, I said, when it comes to improving Rhode Island's education system, we can't be like that painter. We can't wait, and the good news is, we haven't. 38 of 39 cities and towns have joined this effort that we're calling Learn 365 RI. It's a commitment, a commitment to prioritize learning in all our communities. A simple concept. Every home, every day, learning matters. We've built a remarkable statewide team who's doing the work on education. And within our administration, we have experienced staff leading the way. Educationer, Commissioner Anhalika Infante Green, who was recently appointed by the Biden administration to serve on their National Assessment Governing Board. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> Post-secondary Commissioner Shannon Gilkey, who has over 15 years of service in education, with 10 of those in higher ed, and he's reimagining our state schools, Rhode Island College, CCRI, and URI. Thank you, Shannon. And Jeremy Cipetta, our new senior advisor on education with my office, who has firsthand experience as an educator, a principal, and a certified superintendent. There has never been somebody as qualified in education sitting in the governor's office in, that I am aware of in the history of the state of Rhode Island. Thank you, Jeremy. And they're not alone. They're not alone in this effort. Last year, under the leadership of Bob Walsh, a nonprofit called Always Learning Rhode Island was formed to support our Learn 365 efforts to provide guidance to the municipal leaders who have signed those compacts. To date, they've raised over a half a million dollars with the help of the local business community and civic leaders. I'm proud that my wife Susan, a retired teacher, is joining the team as an honorary chair of that board. We know, we know that students who attend school regularly perform on average about 20 points better on reading and math than those who are chronically absent. That's why attendance matters. This school year, our work to dramatically improve attendance is already having a positive impact. I want to recognize Alejandro, a second grader from Webster Elementary School in Providence who is here with us tonight. In kindergarten and first grade, he was chronically absent. However, he turned things around and just received his, perf his first perfect attendance award. Alejandro. Alejandro. Keep, keep up the great work. <laughs> Wonderful. And Bella is here tonight. She's a student at Noel Academy. Because of circumstances behind her, beyond her control last year, Bella was chronically absent. However, she made the commitment to improve her attendance. And this year, she's on track and no longer chronically absent. Bella, Rhode Island is proud of you. Please stand up and let us recognize you as well. And the, and the story, and that story keeps on going. With us tonight, Halandra, a senior at Central Falls High School and a member of our chronic absenteeism working group. 
She's dedicating her free time to help us create attendant solutions for students across our state. Thank you for stepping up in a big way, Bella. Thank you so much. We appreciate your leadership. We're, look, look, we're serious about improving RICAST scores and closing the gap between Rhode Island and Massachusetts by 2030. Rhode Island began to move the needle this year, and, want to, and we want to ensure that progress will continue. That's why my budget will propose $15 million for math and English language arts coaching for stu students and professional development for teachers to help us meet the goal ahead of us. Let's get this done for our students. When it comes, when it comes to education, we are moving ahead as one team with strong educational leaders in the General Assembly, like Representative Joe McNamara. Where's Joe? Joe's around here somewhere. With, we, on board. And Senators Cano and Val Lawson. That team includes our municipal leaders, our teachers, our superintendents, our principals, local AFT and NEA union leaders like Frank Flynn and Mary Barton, who are with us tonight. Thank you for being on Team Rhode Island. Now, we're asking all Rhode Island families, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, guardians, to join our team and get in the game. Because it matters that in every home, every day, learning matters. This is my third State of the State address as governor. But my first as a grandfather. And while my granddaughter, Mabel James, isn't quite old enough to be here tonight, and just like General Callahan's new grandchild, by the way, congratulations, General. And although Mabel James is not here with us tonight, she reminds me why I'm here. She reminds me of why you're here. She reminds me why everyone that's listening in the state of Rhode Island is on board, because we all want a Rhode Island that's better for our kids, for our grandkids, for the next generation, and the one after that. We want to ensure Rhode Island is a place they want to call home and a place they can afford to call home. In last year's State of the State, we set a goal on education. This year, we're going to set a goal to raise per capita income by a minimum of $20,000 by the year 2030. Just think, just think how much housing insecurity and food insecurity we could address as a state if we double down and work to raise per capita income across Rhode Island, helping every family in our state and just like we did with our education goal. Within the next 100 days, we will roll out a game plan for raising incomes with the help of Ernie Amanti, Executive Director of Leagues and Cities and Towns, and Ed Topaldi, an economist and professor at, Bra professor at, Bra at Bryant University. Later this week, I'll be submitting my budget to the General Assembly. The budget will prioritize programs and initiatives that will help us raise the incomes of our fellow Rhode Islanders while controlling recurring costs. We will continue the fiscal discipline we have shown over the past two years using one-time funds for one-time investments and budgeting within our means so we won't be forced to revise our budget as other states are and make disruptive mid-year cuts. Our budget, our budget will make key investments in education, small business, and Rhode Island's health care system without raising, raising any broad-based taxes. I, I happen to think that's worth applause. 
The good news, we don't have to start from scratch. Thanks to President Biden and our congressional delegation, led by Senator Jack Reed, Rhode Island has secured historic amounts of federal funds. Congressman Magazina, on behalf of Rhode Island, thank you to you and your colleagues for securing these funds. Congressman Langevin, those dollars were earmarked by your leadership. Thank you. Our team put these dollars to work to create unprece unprecedented pipeline of projects that will pe put people to work in good paying jobs and help raise the incomes across our state. The impact, an impact that will be felt for decades to come. In addition to creating good paying jobs, we must ensure that Rhode Island is an affordable place to live. We must ensure that our young families can purchase their first homes and that our nurses and public safety workers, our laborers, our teachers can live in the community that they work in. For far too long, Rhode Island has had one of the lowest housing production rates in the nation. That's why our administration proposed, and I'm grateful to the General Assembly for approving over a quarter billion dollars investments in housing in 2022. And an additional... <laughs> and an additional $71 million in housing in the last year's budget. In sum, since I've been governor, we've allocated nearly a half a billion dollars to housing. And while building doesn't happen overnight, we continue to see signs of progress. Under our leadership of Housing Secretary Stephen Pryor, we already have 1,600 homes in the pipeline with more on their way. And thanks to our Down Payment Assistance Program, we're helping over 1,500 first-time home buyers like the Cruz family who are with us tonight. I like it. Juan and Emily, and their two sons moved into their first home in West Warwick last year using our down payment assistance program. I was there to welcome them. Uh, their son actually gave me a little seashell, and, uh, and we loved that because it meant something to him that he was walking into his first home, and he wanted to say thank you. He actually gave me a little, another little gift tonight, so thank you so much. I want to congratulate them on their new home and thank them for choosing Rhode Island it is important that we recognize that home ownership is a key to creating generational wealth. In addition to new housing tools passed last year, the budget I'll propose will call for a $100 million housing production bond on the ballot. This would be the largest housing production bond in our state's history. And we're going to ensure that, if approved by the voters, these dollars will create more inventory and help put more young people on a path to home ownership in our state. Because we know that home ownership for everyone in this room is one of the top ways to build generational wealth. So let's get that done. We know that states across the country are dealing with issues in their health care systems. Hospitals are facing financial difficulties and shortages of primary care doctors are creating challenges for patients. Under the leadership of Health and Human Service Secretary Rick Charest, our administration is educated to strengthening, dedicated to strengthening the state's health care system. And Rick is no stranger to this work. He is a former CEO of Landmark Medical Center, where he led a significant turnaround, bringing the hospital out of receivership. And when I recruited him to state government, thanks, Rick, for accepting. Where are you, by the way? You're hanging around here somewhere. Thank you for accepting and taking my call. He immediately went to fix 
the longstanding challenges we inherited at Elena Slater Hospital and made significant progress in improving patient safety and increasing staff morale. And thank you to the General Assembly for appropriating dollars to uh, you know, go out and fix that hospital in Boroughville and in Cranston. The budget, the budget I proposed last year that the General Assembly passed included new state-directed payments to hospitals. These new payments contain, combined other changes, resulted in $110 million in new Medicaid funding to our state hospitals. The budget I'll propose this year will once again include crucial funding. Additionally, our budget will propose over $135 million in investments to increase health care provider rates and support the behavioral health needs of Rhode Islanders. Some provider rates have not been increased in over 10 years. We know how important early intervention is for our children and families. The cru this crucial program promotes development of infants and toddlers who have a developmental disability or delay. In addition to the federal funding that we directed to early intervention providers to strengthen their workforce, the budget I'll propose to the General Assembly will fully fund early intervention rate increases recommended, recommended by the Office of Health Insurance Commissioner and our EOHHS office. <laughs> Finally, in collaboration with Secretary Charest in the coming weeks, I'll be signing an executive order focused on improving Rhode Island's health care system and planning work to ensure we have access to an efficient and effective health care delivery system aligned with our state's needs. The working group created as part of this executive order will be comprised of members from my health cabinet, professionals, with broad input from a wide array of stakeholders who will be ready to do the work. Under the leadership of the Department of Health, Dr. Bandy, Director Dr. Bandy, we're building a new state health lab, which my uh, partners up here had a great deal to do with. This public-private partnership will also have much needed wet lab space, which will be essential to growing Rhode Island's life science industry. For a decade, leaders have stepped up to the microphone, just like that painter that never got that sunset painted, and talked about how Massachusetts is a leader in life science and that Rhode Island could be as well. Instead of dreaming of that possibility, thanks to the leadership of Speaker Sakachi, we're making it a reality. Our administration worked with the Speaker and the General Assembly to propose a quasi-public agency dedicated to our state's life science strategy, and we included $45 million in last year's budget to support this sector. Neil Steinberg, I think she's here tonight, who will be, lead, will be leading our life science strategy, is here with us tonight. And I want to thank the Senate for confirming his appointment earlier this month. Neil, stand up. <laughs> jobs in the life science sector are good paying jobs, usually commanding six figures. We want these jobs in Rhode Island to help raise per capita income, to grow the talent pipeline and solidify Rhode Island as a life science leader. My budget will propose building a new life science school at the University of Rhode Island through a bond referendum. I will, I will be out across the state with our UR, URI president, Mark Palange, rallying Rhode Islands behind this important income-raising initiative.
Is the is Mark here? I'm not sure whether Mark made it, made it in the stove. He is here. There you go. Mr. President, we're on tour. We're all going statewide, all 39 cities and towns. Thanks to Rhode Island College, President Jack Warner, teaming up with former Congressman Jim Langevin, we launched the first State Institute of Cybersecurity and Emerging Technology at Rhode Island College. Tonight, tonight, we're joined by Jillian Costello and Nigel Gomes, two students who are already enrolled in the Institute and on a path to a good paying job in this emerging industry. Jillian and Nigel, please stand up. Be recognized. Thank you for being a part of Team Rhode Island. Cybersecurity is a rapidly growing field with thousands of unfilled positions. To have Congressman Langevin leading the charge on this, we are blessed. He is a national leader who's going to bring national recognition to Rhode Island College. Thank you, Congressman. An information security an analyst is now ranked as one of the top five best jobs in the nation with a medium salary of $112,000. We want these jobs in Rhode Island to help raise per capita income. Cybersecurity Institute at RIC is equipping the next generation of cybersecurity professionals with the technical and business skills to meet the cybersecurity challenges of the 21st century. To meet the potential that this field offers, I'm calling on us to take the next level. Let's pass a first of its kind cybersecurity bond to grow Rhode Island College's current cybersecurity program into a cybersecurity school of choice. And in five years, let's have 1,000 students enrolled in this graduating, in this school, graduating. 250 students a year with this degree, and let's raise our per capita income in the state of Rhode Island. <laughs> Raising incomes also means making sure our retirees can afford to stay in Rhode Island. Right now, Treasurer James, James Diosa is spearheading a pension advisory work group to look at our potential changes to our state's pension system. We're also working with his office on legislation to create Secure Choice, a new voluntary retirement savings program. Treasurer, thank you for your leadership. <laughs> while, that, while that works continues, let's act now to raise the threshold for taxable retirement income so our retirees can keep more money in their pockets, I will be sending a budget proposal to the General Assembly to make this happen. It's, it's the right thing to do. We are not only want to keep our grandkids and our kids here in Rhode Island, we also want to make sure the people who invested in this state retire in this state. Rhode Island is a small business state. I know that, not only as governor, but also as a former small business owner. That's why one of my top priorities is making Rhode Island a better place to do business. But let's not forget what we have accomplished with the General Assembly, with the reps and the senators in this room, with our speaker with our Senate President. We sped up and fully eliminated the car tax. We wiped out the tangibles for 75% for of Rhode Island businesses. Thank you, Senate President, for your leadership and your chamber's leadership on that issue. We, el <laughs> we, uh, we eliminated the so-called litter tax on businesses. We delivered $35 million in utility tax uh, utility rate relief for families and businesses. We've exempted the trade-in values of motorcycles from sales tax 
for the purchase of new motorcycles for all our motorcycle fans out there. We increased access to capital for small businesses. And altogether, we have provided tens of millions of dollars in tax relief to local businesses without increasing broad-based taxes a penny. And we're not stopping there. The budget I'll send to the General Assembly this week will keep that progress going. I will call for reducing the corporate minimum tax from $400 to $350. This tax impacts our state's smallest businesses the most. Let's give them more relief. I'm targeting six annoying fees for elimination, including the redundant real estate broker and liquor manufacturing fees. Let's get rid of these small, aggravating uh, permits and fees uh, that just bog down our small businesses in terms of that time. And we're also proposing funding to help more minority and women-owned businesses get certified to qualify for more state contracts. We cannot build an economy without including each and every family, each and every business in that economy. Secretary Liz Tanner and her team at Commerce know that it's Rhode Island's turn to be a leader in small business friendliness. Together, we're not only making progress, but we're going to get it done. In addition to the budget I'll propose, I'm looking forward to working with the General Assembly on several key issues. Finding common ground and reforming the Law Enforcement of, uh, law of Officers Bill of Rights. <laughs> Finding new ways to speed up housing production. And this year, let's finally pass an assault weapons ban in Rhode Island. Now, I want to share some highlights from our state's economic hubs that are sustaining good-paying jobs and keeping our progress going. We're making the biggest investment in the Port of Galilee in decades. Galilee isn't just the home of Georges and Champlains. The port is one of Rhode Island's economic and job powerhouses. In fact, Galilee is the fourth highest value fishing port on the East Coast, and the 18th highest value port in the United States. Department of Environmental Manager Terry Gray is here tonight with Ryan Clark, President and CEO of the Town Dock, a family business down in Galilee. The Town Dock is one of the leading calamari suppliers in the United States, Rep. Rep. McNamara. Well, you got to love that. Their facilities are directly behind one of our upgrade projects, and we're glad to see them benefiting, benefiting, benefiting from the work. Ryan, thanks for all you do and for being on Team Rhode Island. Let's give him and all our small business a big round of applause for the work that they do each and every day. Last year, we, want, we launched a new program through the Department of Transportation to help our cities and towns expedite, expedite repairs and local roads and bridges. Uh, are we all tired of being the, the lowest ranked on roads in the, in the country? I am. I am. All 39 cities and towns participated, and, and here are the results from the budget that was passed last year, the $20 million we appropriated that is now creating $75 million of local work. 622 total projects, representing 456 lane miles of road and nearly 24 miles of sidewalk. As the state works to improve Rhode Island's infrastructure rankings, we want to provide support to our, our, our municipalities 
to do the same. That's why my budget will call for another $5 million so this program can continue and we support our local 39 cities and towns. I told you there was a lot to share. DOT Director Peter Alvidi is here tonight, along with our municipal leaders who stepped up in a big way to capitalize on this program. And while we're talking about our transportation infrastructure, I want to take a minute to acknowledge the frustration that many Rhode Islands experienced when we had to make the decision to quickly close part of the Washington Bridge as a public safety measure. I know this impacted routines like getting to doctor's appointments and taking kids to school. So I want to once again thank Rhode Islanders for their patience and understanding. We look forward to getting the Washington Bridge open as quickly as possible, but we are determined to make sure that our bridges are safe, that our roads are repaired, and that this national ranking that has been around our necks for far too long goes away. I want to thank the people at DOT who are doing the work to fix our roads and bridges. Just take a ride up Route 295, which was repaved for the first time in over 20 years. We have waited too long to make this investment, and with the help of the General Assembly, we are going to keep that going so that we are driving our infrastructure represents the progress that this state is making. With the first working offshore wind farm in the United States, we know that Rhode Island is an industry leader, but we're not stopping there. Our second offshore wind project, Revolution Wind, is set to commence construction this year. When construction is complete, Revolution Wind will power nearly 263,000 households at a rate of 9.8 cents per kilowatt for 20 years. This is an important step toward meeting our Act on Climate Goal. In order to get our offshore wind projects completed, we need people doing the work. A few of our offshore work, wind workers are here tonight, and I want to thank them. Nicole Kent of IBEW Local 99. <laughs> Nicholas Russo of Laborers Local 271. and Jennifer O'Dwyer of Ironworkers Local 37. I want to recognize them. Let's recognize them. Please stand up. Thank you so much. We can't get this done in the state of Rhode Island and meet the goals that we're setting without people doing the work. And it's the work that matters. It's not what we talk about. It's the work that matters. Thank you for being on Team Rhode Island. And let's give them another round of applause. But we're not just building the infrastructure. We also, we're also training the workers at the state's first offshore wind safety training center at CCRI Flanagan Campus in Lincoln under the leadership of interim president, Dr. Rosemary Costigan. Rosemary, are you here? Please. We want to. Thank you, doctor. Again, we want these jobs in Rhode Island to help us raise per capita income. In partnership with the General Assembly, we made a significant smart investment in Quonset by directing $60 million to the port of Davisville. As one of North America's top 10 auto importers, more than 200,000 cars crossed the piers of Davisville last year, supporting more than 1,600 jobs. There's, there's far more to that story. Don't have the time to tell it all tonight. 435,000 square feet of new space is either on the drawing board or in production today, and, our, and we're putting people to work by creating opportunities in the future for new jobs. 435,000 square feet. <laughs> and we also have to have a little fun. So we're, go, we're, we're going all in and boosting tourism. 
and raising Rhode Island's national profile. We doubled our investment in destination marketing, and it's working. Last year, our state had over 27 million visitors, an increase of more than 5% compared to the prior year. We're proud to have many of those visitors flying into Rhode Island TF Green International Airport, ranked in the top 10 best airports in the world, right here in Rhode Island. But, but that's not all. This year, Rhode Island became home of Good Burger too, Hocus Pocus too, and the Gilded Age. And we're not stopping there. I'm excited about another new movie that's going to be filmed in Rhode Island this year. It's called Ella McKay, a story about a lieutenant governor who becomes governor. And while that is a familiar story, I have been assured that it's not about yours truly. <laughs> I want to thank Rhode Island Film and Television Office Director Steve Feinberg for doing the work to attract these blockbusters, which helped put Rhode Island on the map in a big way. Give Steve a round of applause. I'm not sure Steve's here tonight. We made a little history this year. Some planned and some not planned. When we moved the independent man from the top of the State House to undergo an historic repair and preservation effort. This was the first time in nearly 50 years, the only second time in state history, that Rhode Islanders could come see the man up close. The independent man is a source of pride for Rhode Islanders. We found that out over the last several weeks. And so is this building, this gem. That's why we're ex ex executing a long overdue cleaning of this building out of shell for the first time in 30 years. It looks good. <laughs> and I want to recognize Department of Administration Director Jonathan Warmer and our team at Division of Capital Asset Management and Maintenance for leading the charge in this effort. They're joined in the gallery tonight by some of the men and women who did the work to remove, remove safely the independent man and clean this historic building. Please stand up, give them a round of applause. I believe they're in the gallery tonight, the men and women who work. Again, tonight is not only about the work we're getting done, but it's the people who are doing the work. We're using this opportunity to invest in the people's house and preserve the independent man for generations of Rhode Islanders and visitors to enjoy. And while we're at it, let's make Rhode Island history a true attraction that brings thousands of tourists to our state every year. In partnership with Secretary of State Greg Amore, let's build a new state archive and history center, a place to display our founding documents and important treasures. My budget, our budget, the people's budget proposal will ask the General Assembly to put this on the 2024 ballot. It's our turn to capitalize on our history and have a place to document what Rhode Island's future holds, which is bright. And speaking of taking pride in our beautiful state, on behalf of the First Lady Susan McKee, who is here tonight, I want to encourage all Rhode Islanders to take our litter-free Rhode Island pledge to keep our state clean. The budget I will submit to the General Assembly will include additional resources to make that happen. Visit litterfreeri.gov to take the pledge. Everyone in the state, let's make a serious effort to make sure that this beautiful state is beautiful. Tonight you heard stories of people across Rhode Island who are doing the work. And there are thousands more just like them all across the state. Team Rhode Island is filled with talented, dedicated players, both in and out of state government, 
I'm inspired by these people every single day and is proud to be working with them. Earlier, I talked about how the very best teams are built when talented individuals use their skills to help others do their very best. That basketball team I coached, I really can't do justice to that story in the short time we have here. They were an example of a team who helped each other do their very best. In many ways, their story is Rhode Island's story too. No one believed they could succeed, but they did. Two state championships, four national championships, invited to the top tournament in the country at Duke University. And just like Rhode Island, they earned the respect they deserved. But what I am most proud of is what they're achieving today as they ra are raising their families in homes that they own when they grew up in homes that they did not own. This is progress for the state in 2024. Team Rhode Island will continue using our skill skills to make our state one of the very best in the nation. We will use our resources to put people to work in good paying jobs on projects that will play, pay dividends for decades to come. My fellow Rhode Islanders, we will become what we believe we can be. Never underestimate the power of a team that has each other's backs. The state of the state is strong. The future is bright, and our very best is well on the way. God bless Rhode Island, and God bless the United States. Thank you all for being here. Good night. Enjoy your evening.